Hey everybody, John Kelly is creative director at Play Simple Games based here in Bangalore, India. Prior to Play Simple, John had a lot of great experience in game design working at companies like Zynga, Wargaming, and Rovio. But uh, we are here today to speak to John about a number of topics related to free to play game design, and I'm really excited to have you here. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. Appreciate you having me on. Yeah, so I, I thought like I gave a very brief introduction to, in terms of your background, but maybe you could also fill us in in terms of the, this, your background and kind of how you wound up here in India. Sure. Um, started out kind of making mods before going to college, studied games, was lucky enough to get started in a studio in the UK called Climax. Mostly spent time there working on a uh, mobile game, or handheld as it wasn't mobile at that point in time, um, making DS games, which was a really fun experience, got me sort of interested in those um, quick iteration cycles, quick development cycles, getting games into players' hands as quickly as possible, and just learning as much as you can as a designer as fast as you can. Um, from there, decided to do a startup, spectacularly unsuccessful. Um, and that really provoked a point of reflection and trying to understand where what was my future going to be in the games industry. I was lucky enough to get an opportunity to work with Zenga um, out here in India, and it was one of those things I couldn't pass up, the opportunity to live on another side of the, the planet, meet new people, new perspectives, and experience something completely different. Just something that you couldn't pass up. Um, working with Zenga was one of the best experiences of my career. Really, really appreciate the opportunities that they gave people there and introduced me to data-driven design and analysis. Coming from a core design background, they changed the entire way I perceived making games and really sort of opened up a whole new tool set and audience in terms of being able to reach and entertain people, which was very, very cool. From there, um, worked with uh, Playground Games, really cool studio in the, in the UK that makes Forza Horizon. They were looking at exploring doing um, free-to-play mobile games. Eventually, they decided that, you know, actually, console is where we're best, and uh, free-to-play mobile is actually a surprisingly scary and expensive business segment to enter, and they continue to focus on their, their core strengths. From there, moved over to Rovio, um, really cool company, really, really interesting to see sort of what is a, a creatively very strong studio, very much leans into that uh, player experience and qualitative game experience. Um, and they were going through that transition into sort of games as a service and, and how they were merging that sort of creative culture with uh, the production realities of having to deliver that content consistently, predictably, and not being really afforded the luxury of getting everything right and everything perfect before you've got to sort of supply your players with the next phase of the game. Um, then briefly, I was at uh, Treasure Hunt where we got to connect a little bit. Yep. Um, very interesting experience in, in Berlin, working with those teams and sort of building out new games um, before joining Wargaming, where I moved over from a pure design role into director of product and uh, supported some of the teams out in uh, Minsk, Moscow, uh, Shanghai, and uh, Los Angeles. Really interesting uh, place to work. Got to work on an awful lot of uh, product ideation, uh, core prototyping. Very much Wargaming is a company that leans in on that um, uh, shooter experience and real core gameplay experiences. So it was great to be working with a bunch of teams sort of exploring around those sort of like uh, really difficult design challenges in terms of how do you translate a, a shooter experience or a combat experience or a driving experience onto a mobile device um, and keep the, the depth and complexity of those systems engaging um, while uh, also not, not overwhelming the player with the amount of complexity. And aligning that with emerging business models, especially when you're in a competitive space in PvP, where you know you can't sell play to win, you can't sell power to to players. You have to be looking at how does the business model actually work, and how do you actually derive profit in a in a place that's very competitive like that. Uh, and then finally, some friends from uh, from my time at Zenga here in India have uh, uh, reached out after they had founded a company here. Asked if I would like to come back to India and help them grow uh, Play Simple to, to the next level. And um, I'd really missed the place. I really wanted to be back in India. And so they got you back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I think it's when you think about your experience at Zynga, Wargaming, Rovio, it definitely seems like some of those companies are so different in terms of the kinds of products that they make and mm -hmm. kind of the disciplines that they have. Uh, 
What, you know, you mentioned a few of the good things about Zynga in terms of data-driven design and things of that nature. What, what are some of the other strong things that you think that, um, whether it's Rovio or Wargaming or Treasure Hunt or whoever, like, are there any specific things from a design perspective you think that some of those companies have done really well? Oh, sure. Uh, I mean, uh, I think Rovio builds probably some of the best quality core game experiences on, on the market. Like, they, yeah. they are really good at building... Uh, really, really well polished, put together fun game experiences. And they put a lot of time and a lot of effort into that. Right. And they tend to be relatively small and high talent density teams. They can make really good stuff. Um, I think um, almost over-reliance on that strength of their very strong visual and design company. Um, and because that kind of dominates the culture of, of Rovio, I think they struggle a little bit more when it comes to stepping back and looking at things from a, a product perspective or a business perspective. Um, there's a, they're also uh, true craftsmen when it comes to the games they make. So there's like, they're like, there's always this kind of tension between production demands and deadlines. Hey, we've got deadlines we need to meet and we need to go out. Right. And the team being like, it's not ready yet. <laughs> and you're like, it looks great. And like, it's not good enough. Like they're, they're definitely yeah. sort of like, uh, very committed to that quality of execution. Right. And I think as the industry matures, that strength is becoming more valuable and more desirable now. Right. I think back in sort of like 2015, 2016, um, we were still sort of like on that growth curve of free-to-play as a market. We hadn't right. really reached a point of um, uh, saturation or, or stability yet right. as, a, as a market. Um, so there was room to get away with sort of the onus was more on moving faster and getting to market and building scalable, viable financial products rather than having to differentiate yourself from the competition with better quality. Right. And I think Rovio was playing a quality game at a point when the market was playing um, speed and scale. Okay. Um, I think as we're reaching maturity, um, those skill sets will probably pay dividends for Rovio going forward. I'd be, be confident as expectations have gone up. Like just the last two years, the amount of really great quality games that have come out has been staggering. Right. So, John, I, I thought maybe we could take it back to India. Sure. So when you compared the experience that you had at your other companies and now here in India, what would you say are some of the differences? And, and certainly from my own personal experience, I have noticed certain characteristics in terms of strengths as well as weaknesses. Mm -hmm. But like, where, where do you think um, Indian, in, in specific to the discipline of game design, where do you think they need to improve or what, how can they get better to be kind of world-class and compete against some of the companies that where, where you've worked at before? Mm. I, I think probably the biggest thing is uh, need to play more games. Okay. And like first step, um, there isn't a gaming culture in India in the same way that there has been in uh, Europe or the United States. Okay. Um, a lot of the, the younger candidates we're talking to haven't really spent all that much time playing games since they were like eight, nine, ten years of age um, up to when they're in their early 20s. Um, and when they have kind of started to really game, it's usually been when they've gotten to college. And they've tended to focus in on one or two titles that they've gained an awful lot of depth and mastery in. They know a lot about that particular game, yeah. but they don't have that breadth of, of learning. And I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges here. Um, like my, my general opinion is it's easier to train um, a game designer to be a relatively decent product manager than it is to train a product manager to be a relatively decent game designer. Right. Because there's just, you, you need literacy in games. You need to have read a breadth of material and examined it and understood it and experienced it. And that just takes time. There's no shortcut to it. Yeah. Um, Whereas skills, tool sets, methodologies, approaches, and, and thinking can be trained in a comparatively short period of time. Um, and I think that's probably one of the big challenges for designers here is they need to be consuming more games. They need to be more broad in, in what they're, they're looking for and, and what they're playing. And you've been in the industry like nine, ten years in terms or have that amount of game design experience. And I was wondering if you like just kind of thinking back and, you know, we're I think we're very fortunate to be in an industry where the you know kind of free-to-play mobile kind of changes and evolves so much but i was wondering if you could give us your perspective from a game design perspective we've seen things like battle pass and gotcha and different kinds of things come into the market and evolve but could you speak to maybe just high level how you have 
how you kind of perceive the early days of gaming when you first started from a design perspective and how that's changing and evolving over time? Sure. Um, so I think we've gotten, uh, the, the big shift has been in, in meta layers across the, the right. games. Um, I suppose in, in, in both regards, both our core gameplays have become more refined and more evolved over time. Mm -hmm. And what you're finding is uh, more sort of hygienic designs. Even though we had pretty simple, pretty clear games uh, in the early days of free-to-play, um, we have maintained similar levels of complexity, but we're surfacing the important features better and earlier in that experience. I think one of the big challenges for a lot of us coming from PC and console into free-to-play and mobile was a misunderstanding of uh, how to value those players' time. Uh, we yeah. were assuming that we had 30 minutes, 45 minutes, 50 minutes of a, of a player's time to get to understand a system, understand how it evolves and, and how it plays out. The reality is we had 30 seconds, maybe 45 seconds. Right. Um, so how you surface mechanics, how you hook your player, how you get a player to understand the entire goal of the game is something that I think has evolved quite a bit over those years. And how that core gameplay aligns and hooks into your meta layer. Uh, like if you go back a couple of years ago, things that would be relatively commonly said in, in some companies would be, hey, just build good core gameplay, make that fun, and then we'll, we'll attach a meta to it. We know how to do that. It's easy. Turns out metas are actually really hard, like really, really hard. Yeah. And how your your core gameplay loop lines up with that meta is the difference yeah. between it being successful or unsuccessful. So we've tried like lots of, we'll benchmark against our competitor, right? We'll okay. deconstruct exactly how they built their meta. We'll build a meta exactly like that and it'll work. And then it doesn't. Um, so I think that understanding, that convergence of uh, product approach and that benchmarking methodological data-driven um, approach is starting to coalesce and align an awful lot better with design principles and uh, sort of that innate gameplay perspective in a, in a much better way. Um, and I, I think we're now seeing the cusp of a new cycle where uh, development and advancement of meta is no longer where the real big competitive advantages are coming from. We're starting to see core gameplay experiences come back into, into focus as things that are really driving, um, I think, PUBG is probably the first big game to, to break this wave where, oh, there's a shooter on mobile and it's popular. Right. Oh, and it works and people like it. And then you've got Call of Duty and then you've got Fortnite and then you've got Genshin Impact. And now you have these like big, heavy, uh, heavy on the gameplay and the haptics and the controls and the fidelity mechanic games offering really big experiences. Genshin Impact is a, a big open world experience on, on the size of Breath of the Wild. Like that's a big game right. with a lot of complexity um, and there's players, there's an audience. So uh, yeah, I think we're, we're seeing this uh, development of these big heavy game experiences that if you were to try and pitch them a few years ago, yeah. um, nobody would have really thought that these would work. Um, I, I think the first large-scale successful shooter on uh, on mobile was World of Tanks Blitz about five years ago that was doing that cross-platform PC to right. to mobile gameplay. Um, but it was still relatively, like, it wasn't setting trends within the industry. I think with the advent of PUBG and a few of the others, we're now mm -hmm. starting to see those console-level experiences come across. And I think probably the most exciting future is going to be that convergence of truly cross-platform games um, can play on PC, can play on console, can play on mobile. That's that's going to be a very exciting space for us, I think. So for game designers today, or maybe even for new game designers, given like where we are, the, the changes that have occurred, uh, what kind of skills do you think it takes to be a great free-to-play game designer in today's world? Mm. I think first is, uh, first and foremost is, empathy, being able to like identify who your target audience is and really empathize with who they are and what they're looking for in the in their gaming experiences. Because while well, I've just spoken about the, the exciting world of cross-platform uh, core experiences, yeah. we're also seeing gaming expand at the other end of the spectrum into ever more sort of casual genres. We're seeing um, stuff like uh, word games become significant parts of the the industry in terms of the amount of revenue, the amount of players involved with it. Um, we're seeing growth in um, chess, Sudoku, um, very simple color matching puzzle games, um, match the color. Uh, Hyper Casual is doing an awful lot of interesting things with very accessible experiences. 
And as a, a free-to-play designer, one of the great things is you get a lot of opportunity to entertain a lot of very different people. But if your perspective is narrowly focused on, on a single type of game or a single genre or a single audience, um, it can be very difficult for free-to-play fe to feel like a rewarding place to work. Right. And when you think about like game design or game designers in terms of different categories or role, how do you think about it in your mind in terms of, is there like a, there's certainly like a, maybe a feature designer economy or level or balancing type of designer? Uh, what are the different kinds of designers? Or if, if somebody's interested about in game design in free to play, how do you kind of categorize those or split those up in a team what, in, in your experience? Sure. I mean, a, a lot of companies will sort of break things down. They'll, they'll specialize. Like you'll get a feature spec designer who's, right. who's specifically, this quarter we're going to put out five new features. Or we're going to do two game events. You might specifically have event designers. You might have narrative designers and level designers. Um, particularly if you're making a match three or a puzzle game or something like that. Like there's a uh, depth of understanding that has to be garnered there. Uh, and they do become very specialized almost to that very specific game and that very specific instance and really understanding how that audience will react to things. Um, but I think in general for a free to play designer, um, it's more important to be a generalist than a specialist until you've at least kind of reached a f more than a few years of experience in the industry. Okay. And the reason for that is um, in free to play, the game is the business model and the business model is the game. And it has to be seen as a holistic whole. You need to be able to make that business model fun. How do we earn money in this game when it is essentially free to players and make that a good experience. So you have to be spreading yourself wide and understanding as much of the spectrum of design as you can and getting okay. as much exposure as you can earlier in your career. Once you've built mastery and, and that's sort of like a concept you've internalized, then I think it's it's perfectly fine to specialize and dive deep on something and, and that really interests you. Um, but I think specializing early on puts you at a in a difficult place and it gives you, you know, kind of covers one eye when it comes to looking okay. at free to play. So kind of start broad and then start building levels of specialization. Yeah. Okay. Got it. And what do you think are like, um, maybe, maybe if you're thinking about future trends, we, we talked about how the free to play kind of game design, um, has, has kind of evolved over time, but like in terms of future trends, what do you think if you're, if you're mentoring a game designer about how to prepare for the future, what would you say to them? Mm. Um, very broad, <laughs> yeah, hard question. Um, because it like we're we're also seeing divergence of opportunities and ends of the spectrum. Yeah. Like if somebody is in a in a place and a mindset and a perspective as a designer that they're um, they're looking for those more snacky casual experiences and they're hyper casual aligned mm -hmm. in their sensibilities. Um, the path for them would be very different from a designer who's more attracted to the core end of the spectrum. Okay. Um. But I, I think, hmm, let me think about the answer to this. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, once more on the question. Well, just like future trends. Mm. Um, so meaning like, so I mean, I mean, one way to think about this would be whether it's from a skill set perspective, like, you know, it's going to be more important to know certain skills or whether it's from like a features perspective, like uh, understanding, um, like player profiles and being able to uh, to design features for specific type of players or like, are, you know, so in UA, for example, that's all of a sudden because of IDFA deprecation, mm -hmm. that's starting to become like a point of emphasis while creative optimization is kind of coming back in vogue and then um, player uh, profiling is starting to come, uh, you know, become very popular. But like when you think about some of the trends today, and for a game designer to be prepared for any changes or for the future, like, you know, any thoughts on that? Sure. I, I think it's probably just a continuation of a, a trend we've seen for the last couple of years in, in terms of um, really understanding uh, your system's design, whether you're a feature designer, an event designer, a level designer, or, or you're the lead designer on a project. Um, the expectation of being able to understand complex interconnected systems and how they relate back to a player experience right. is going to become increasingly more uh, more valuable and more important to designers. We are seeing a maturation, 
at all ends of the spectrum in terms of quality of experience. Mm -hmm. I think the quality of games that are being put out in 2022 is noticeably higher than the quality of games being put out in 2020. Right. The the standards are are moving a lot. Right. Um, so ultimately that comes down to how do you build your systems? How do you build your mechanics? How do you transition them uh, to communicating with your player and providing an end experience that's exciting and motivating? And I think we're going to see more of a focus on uh, brand IP um, positioning of your game in terms of it being cool and aspirational um, than we have seen up to this point in time. I think you're, we're going to see the companies that are capable of reaching out and speaking to gamers emotionally will start to outperform uh, other companies at this point in time, which hasn't really been true in free-to-play where your analytical ability, your ability to optimize growth campaigns... Okay probably gave you a competitive advantage over a studio that, that didn't have that. So I think more traditionally powerful companies, uh, Nintendo, Blizzard, if they start making more moves towards mobile, we're going to see them continue to, uh, to drop consistent big hits um, because I think the market is going to favor those longer-term skills and they'll start to be able to compensate for some of the weaknesses that they've had up to this point in time okay. and the, the weight will shift. I wanted to ask you a uh, next question, really having to do with um, with part of the work. So like for a feature designer and for many designers, the design spec seems to be the center of like what they work on in mm -hmm. terms of a deliverable. And I know at our studio, we've tried to innovate on design specs. In, in other words, like what would a future design spec look like? How could we change it? Um, I, we didn't, we made some progress and I, I think we'll probably take another attempt at it on a future game. And I know there are some studios who have completely like changed their design spec methodology where it's like no more design specs. It's all just wires and flows and things like that. But like, I'm wondering from your perspective, you know, how do you think about design specs? Do you think the future is all traditional design specs or just, just wanted to get your thoughts on, on that? Um, I think much like sort of your approach to production methodologies, um, your spec needs to be tailored to the group of people you have. Um, not the other way around. I mean, trying to find a, a perfect template that works for the industry, I think, is just not going to work. Um, depends on on the people, their experience, their perspectives, how they like to work, how they communicate with each other. I think the the important things around a, um, a spec is clarity and uh, pithiness of communication. Mm -hmm. It needs to be. Uh, very clear. Why does why does this need thing need to get made? Why is it exciting? Um, if it's a player fo facing component, what are the risks involved? What are the things we need to be careful of? When's it due? Who's responsible for it? Yeah. Um, <laughs> are, are are kind of the key things that you want out of that? Right. Um, and a good synopsis of like what what is the overall thing and how does it fit in in relation to the rest of the game? Right. If you can kind of cover those things, it doesn't really matter how you write your spec, whether it's all in traditional old school, like A4 page typed up technical style document or right. whether it's a uh, whether it's a fancy PPT or whether you're doing it in a mirror board. I don't think it really matters all that much as long as the way you're doing it is a way that your team will consume it and read it. Right. The reason we moved away from the big thick game design documents right. that we did back in the day to PowerPoint presentations was because nobody read the GDD. Right. Um, they'd skim it, they'd look at, oh, okay, I kind of get it, and then they'd make up their own thing as they were, they were implementing stuff. But now we're in a situation where I've seen PowerPoint spec decks that are 150 slides long, and I'm like... <laughs> it's the same problem. <laughs> yeah. You know, like that's that's not not solving the the challenge here. Um some of the best specs I've seen have been three pages. Okay. All right, so one last question for you here. And since we're here in India, wanted to get your thoughts in terms of your outlook for of the Indian free-to-play gaming industry. And I don't know if you have any specific thoughts on design out of India, but um your thoughts on India. Cool. Uh, yeah, I think India is probably one of the most exciting places, uh, emerging markets and games. Um, the amount of new studios that have cropped up here in the last few years, the, uh, the shift from providing services to other companies in terms of game development to building their own stuff and finding an Indian design voice and competing on the world stage with that is 
really exciting to be part of um, and it'll be very interesting to see how that evolves and comes to the fore. I think you're going to see some very interesting stuff, very exciting things coming out of it. It's also a very young country, very energetic country and a very driven country. So there, there's a, a push, there's a momentum here that you can just feel like even coming from places like uh, Helsinki or Berlin, which are considered like startup hotbeds with lots of cool game stuff happening. The pace here is just, it's one step faster. There's just that little bit more excitement and rush towards where this future is taking people right. that I think is really inspiring to see. Like, I, I think it's very, very cool. Um, there's still a very, there's a very analytical perspective on things here. And I think because of that, you're going to see uh, Indian successes appear in places that you didn't really expect to see successes. I think Play Simple is a good example of that. Um, I don't think you would have seen a company be that successful in word games. Like, would, would not necessarily have been one of the places I would have said, this is going to become a, a significant company right. um, pursuing that genre, where a lot of times, if you're just looking at doing a, an app and the analysis of the amount of money that was in that market, um, at a surface level uh, examin examination, not necessarily the most exciting segment, but they found potential in it and they were able to grow the segment. And I think you're going to start continue to see that very smart business analysis driving the Indians, Indian game industry going into unusual places and being very successful because of that. Um, there's a, there isn't the same technical expertise in like and depth in India uh, that you get in the West or the US or, or Japan right. yet. Um, I think it's maturing rapidly. There's a lot of learning happening in a very, very short period of time, but it's harder to build a unreal based team here than it is sure. <laughs> <laughs> than it is in a lot of other places. Yeah. Uh, and because of that, it's, it's also going to shape some of the directions that I think this market goes in. Right. Um, but it's, I, if you've visited India and you've visited Bangalore, where a lot of places would say, well, then it can't be done. I really believe in sort of India's ability to find solutions to things where everyone else would look at and go, that's impossible, <laughs> and they will make it work. Right. Probably not in, in super elegant ways to begin with, but I think it's going to be remarkably effective. Um, one of my favorite words living in India is jagad, where like thing has been put together. It looks like it, it shouldn't function, <laughs> but it's actually remarkably effective. Um, and I can kind of see that in the team and how they, they approach building their specs and building their features. And I kind of look and go, it's an unusual way to approach things, but it works. Yeah. And it's a new perspective, new, new, new view on the world. And I, I think for me, I'm learning a lot being here in terms of I haven't seen it all yet. There are new, new ways to approach th things. <laughs> Okay, John, so for this next segment, we've got a number of young game designers who have kind of submitted questions, and I want to ask you some of these questions as the experienced guy here. Uh, the first question is about the career trajectory of a game designer. Um, how do you grow into a leadership position as a game designer? Um, excellent question. So I think first and foremost, leadership is more about being able to help your team find answers to solutions and, and be okay. broad in spectrum. It's not just about being the best at your craft. Um, like just being the best designer in the studio doesn't make you the lead designer. Uh, right. It's more being able to help the entire team move forward. So what I would say in terms of building skill sets, one, go broad first, get yeah. to understand how design interacts and interfaces with the rest of the, the teams within the, the game. Okay. Um, and then start to realize that leadership is about people. Build those soft skills, be able to motivate people, be able to challenge people when you need to challenge people. And keep focused on what the high level goal is of what you're working on, be that a feature or a quarterly release or the entire game. You need to be able to dis demonstrate and display the ability to keep the eye, your eye on the prize mm -hmm. and help the team consistently move towards that. Um, right. And be the person willing to make decisions and calls when everyone else is afraid or is overly procrastinating or trying to 
to avoid making hard calls. Okay. Be the one to accept the accountability and the responsibility for it. Right. You will get things wrong. That's going to be bad. Um, but ultimately, if you can show those qualities, that's how you move towards being a lead okay. in a company. It is about the people more than it is about the design. Got it. And maybe I can ask a follow-up question of my own to this question. So like, let's say you are a design lead and there's a designer who's not performing how what would be like the the personal or the, the the soft skills that you need or how would you motivate that person to to kind of improve or work more or something like that i think first thing is is empathy and understanding why mm -hmm. is that person not performing yeah. um being able to step back and look at the situation they're in is it um something in their personal life that is potentially distracting them from the job are they um overthinking the amount of pressure that's on them are they getting lost in the complexity of the task they're doing have they got a conflict with somebody else on the team try to understand and put yourself in their shoes as to why they're not working most people um, particularly if they've got a couple of years of experience in the industry and have proven themselves yeah. are there to work they're there to make games where this is a passion driven industry there's very few people in games companies that aren't there to make a great game at the end of the day yeah. so if that person is not performing there's probably a reason for it and you need to sort of be analytical about it and try to diagnose what it is as a lead then you start thinking about what can you do to mitigate that situation is it something within your power and ability to change within the team is it um, who they're working directly with, is it the task that they have assigned, do they just need somebody that they can vent to, those are all things. Sometimes there isn't solutions to it, at which point in time um, it's important to challenge that person. Make them clear and aware early on that they are failing to underperform. Right. Even if they have a good reason for it, even if there's a reason for them struggling that you can completely empathize with, they need to be made aware that it has been recognized by not just you, but probably their peers around them, the rest of the company, that you're not performing. Right. Um, because if this continues, it will escalate, it will come to a difficult situation. You don't want to surprise somebody and be like, you've been doing a bad job for the last year. And they're like, you didn't tell me. You can't, <laughs> yeah, right, right? <laughs> you, you can't yeah. tell that to somebody, particularly if they're absorbed in something that is chewing up a lot of their mental space. Okay. Um, so inform them first, um, try to help them find a solution. and. If that's not working, then you do need to draw hard lines in the sand and set expectations. This needs to get better or there will be consequences. Right. These are the expectations for you to continue at the company. Okay. The next question here is working with other teams or how do you be steadfast and confident in delivering de design decisions while at the same time welcoming the feedback and opinion of others? So like, let's say maybe there's an engineer or other folks from product management that are questioning a design decision, how do you be confident versus accepting feedback is what I believe the gist of the question is. Okay, so I think the first thing to do is work on your listening skills. Mm -hmm. I allow people the space and the opportunity to, uh, to give you the feedback, to tell you the things, to state their case. Don't jump to an answer immediately. Stop, okay. take stock of what they're saying, weigh and analyze the the feedback it's very easy to get emotional and just try to prove like no we need to keep moving fast or they're challenging something that i've made that is a core assumption right. i'm feeling threatened by it don't let your emotions get involved in it as much as you you possibly can as a, a human being yeah. weigh that feedback come to your own critical conclusion on whether it is appropriate and aligns with what the goals of the feature the game the phase you're working on the event whatever it is and then make your decision on whether you believe you're on the right course of action or not, mm -hmm. and be prepared to accept accountability for that decision. Okay. It's easy to, um, to stay steadfast and committed to your design when you're willing to accept the accountability for the consequences of the thing you're committing to. Okay. If you're unsure, further discussion, debate, talk through things, find something that you have higher degrees of confidence in. But as the designer, you're accountable for the design outcomes. Right. Don't get pushed into making decisions that you won't accept accountability for, and don't commit to things that you won't accept accountability for. Got it. Okay. Next question. Large versus compact design teams. We understand that it's based on the needs of the project, but is there a general philosophy? So like how big should a design team be seems like what they're asking. So the smaller you can make it without burning yourselves out is probably what I would go with. Okay. The simple reason for that is 
uh, communication headwinds. The larger your team, the more robust your communication processes and practices have to be, yeah. the further people are separated from each other. Um, and one of the primary factors in a successful game project is the quality of communication between members of the team. Right. It's just far easier to be good at that when there's fewer of you. Right. Um, and you're always balancing that off against, well, how much work can we do? How much pressure are we under? Um, some Frequently, it makes sense to add another designer to take some of the load, but over a, over a certain number, you have rapidly diminishing returns. Okay. And hiring for game designers. Um, what do you think about the current state of talent in India? And then how do you think about hiring for potential, meaning people, I think what they're talking about here are um, not someone who doesn't necessarily have the skills yet versus, so hiring for potential, easy to find versus skill, hard to find versus senior, easier to find but doesn't match in skill. Mm. Sure. Um, I think where the development scene is in India right now, mm -hmm. um, there are relatively few very experienced guys right. who've, who've been through multiple cycles on new product and live operations. I can right. stitch that entire thing together. Um, there's relatively few of them and yeah. they're, they're at a point in their career where they, they can largely pick their projects, right? They, mm -hmm. they, they get to choose where they want to go. They sure. have many options. Um, so those guys are hard to find and, right. and really great when you do. On the other two, I think where I I fall on this uh, at the moment in India is higher for passion and potential. Right. Um, I'm, I think a lot of companies here are more than willing to invest in people who are smart and help them build the skills and knowledge to get there. Um, if they're passionate, committed, and, and smart, I think mm -hmm. that's more important than anything else. Um, the thing is, particularly if you're early in your career, your first one, two, three, four years, um, you might have great exposure to one genre at that point in time, and you might have reached a level of like expertise even in, in that amount of time in your one genre, but you probably haven't had enough time to spread out into other facets of the industry and right. other challenge um, propositions. Yeah. Um, so I think unless you have a high talent density of those plus 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 plus years guys, you have to be willing to invest in your people and, and hire for potential and intelligence rather than experience. Got it. Okay, design documentation. What do you think about speed of with iteration time later versus detailed, more upfront design documentation at the start? Um, so there's two thoughts here. Is one is the iteration cycle of uh, get the broad strokes of a feature spec'd out, okay. get it into production, check in frequently, play test it, look at it on device, and get that constant iterative cycle going um, is really valuable. Um, but I think it's definitely worth giving a designer a day or a day and a half to sit down and write a document. Forcing them, one of the reasons I'm still a fan of the older style game design documents uh -huh. and is it forces a designer to step through each piece of the right. logic on their entire feature right. all the way down to get it on paper. Even if it never sees a, like another right. person, that process of interrogating your own internal logic before you right. put together your fancy PPT and go into that iteration cycle will save you a lot of time. Right. So I like to encourage designers at Play Simple to take a bit of pre-production time, think about it, interrogate the logic, walk through it whether that's writing or through doing wireframes, however each designer likes to do it, it doesn't really matter, but spending some time up front to make sure that you haven't fallen for the, the god of the gaps. Yeah. Your brain just glosses over yeah. like the details so in there, things. and then you're like, oh, this is actually a significant problem. Yeah. Um, so try to find as many of those before, before you actually commit additional resources in the studio to building your feature. Right, I, I definitely agree with you on that. I mean, that's the reason why some companies like Amazon force like some meetings to be written first versus just having verbal kind of conversations. Okay, um, and then the next question is, how do I understand myself in terms of the type of game designer, systems, features, economies, et cetera, I want to be? So as a young game designer, how sh should I go with industry requirements or should they follow the path that they want to be? Um, I would say follow the industry requirements. Build your okay. skill, build your visibility around you. Uh, let's say you really want to be an economy designer, but you can find a position as a, a level designer. Mm -hmm. Go do it, learn it, 
you'll be in proximity with economy designers. You'll get to have visibility on how it's really right. done. Um, and then you can decide whether you want to go into it. The problem for somebody new in the career or outside of the industry looking in is we have a lot of assumptions about how it works yeah. and it's frequently wrong. Right. Um, so get in, get your experience first, be as generalistic as you can early in your career, take the opportunities, learn new things, get pushed outside of your comfort zone. When you've hit year four, five, six, then look at where your specialization takes you. Right. You'll be a better specialist for it. Great. Uh, okay, here's, here's a question. What do you expect from a young game designer if they work under you? Um, I expect them to learn <laughs> more than anything else. Um, I expect them to show up, yeah. be committed, be motivated, um, take those opportunities as they're, as they're given yeah. um, and run with it and, and try to push themselves to grow as much as they can. Okay. Um, I like to see them accept accountability for what they're doing. Right. If, you, if you see somebody showing true ownership around what they're doing, um, even if they get it wrong, that's okay. Like your, your senior or your lead or whoever is there to save your butt. Like they're right. supposed to step in and pull your butt out of the fire when it goes wrong. Right. Because it will. You're a junior. You will make mistakes. That's okay. But absorbing that accountability and, and owning the outcomes of what you're building is probably the most important thing. Okay. Uh, having an analytical mindset, stopping thinking about what you're doing before you do it, right. and paying attention to who your players are and empathizing with them. Okay. Looks like we have a career question. What is best for a young game designer to jump companies to get a higher, a more hike, I guess, in terms of the compensation, or stay in one company for a long time and earn value? Um, this sounds like a, a salary advancement question, <laughs> um, and ultimately that comes down to the organization you're at. If your company okay. treats you well and is willing to... Um, to invest in you over the long term and yeah. you've seen them do it for other people, yeah. uh, I would say um, consistency is better. Yeah. Um, the relationships you build, particularly in your early career, right. uh, I think one of the hardest things for the work from home um, thing that happened was for a couple of years for people at the beginning of their careers, they didn't get the opportunity to right. build those connections with right. people, build that network that's going to carry them all the way through their career. Yeah. Like the people I rely on now when I'm stuck on a thing are the guys I worked with on my first game and the first year <laughs> the people I call. I'm like, I'm stuck, I don't know what to do, I need somebody to talk to. Um, and that's, that's really valuable. So if you can right. build connection with people, right. that's, that's incredibly important, not just the dollar value. Flip side, if your company doesn't respect you, there's lots of opportunities. Absolutely. Okay, another career question. Uh, how do I prepare myself to work at a big company like Blizzard or Riot? Mm, interesting question. Um, so the thing about a company like Blizzard or Riot is they're so famous, they are able to attract the absolute best of the best of the best. Right. Um, if you're looking at your skill sets and you're like, I'm doing pretty okay, but you know, like, I can't put something in front of people and they go, wow, that's, that is great. Yeah. Um, you're not ready to really, like you're not going to be able to get through that interview process. Right. They, like it's a rigorous process and they have a, such a wealth of talents applying to them um, that it, it's, you have to be focusing on having that level of special skill that can really help you stand out. And that's somewhat in contradiction of what I was saying. I think it's better for most designers to work as a generalist and then swap into a, into a uh, specialist if you want to get to a place like Blizzard or Riot early in your career. Like, I think if, I don't know the exact numbers, but I think if you were to look at the mean amount of experience being hired into Blizzard or Riot, it's probably not many people getting hired with less than five or six years worth of experience at a minimum to, to go there. Uh, or exceptional standout levels of talent. Right. Um, the other thing to be aware of is if you join somewhere like Blizzard or Riot, you're not going to be special. Like, you've spent all this time building these amazing skills that everyone kind of goes, wow, and now you join a room full of those people. Um, you need to prepare yourself for going back to being just another guy in the team. Okay. Uh, how do you validate as a designer whether you are following best design practices in the industry? Um, Excellent question. I don't think you can because there aren't really best practices in the industry. Um, depending on what country you're in, what kind of genre you're in, what kind of game you're building, all of that moves and changes. Um, the, I think, I think the best practice in in terms of making games is 
clarity of communication, clarity of accountability, clarity of goals. If you can make sure that your design is supporting those things, how you practice your methodologies in the studio is supporting those things, that's as close to best practice as you're going to get. Um, because each studio will approach it differently depending on the skills and knowledge and background of those people there. Um, and tools that you think are wonderful in your studio, you'll go to another studio and like, no, 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 we don't do it like that at all. That's not, that's not how we do things. Right. Um, so it changes so much. Okay. Be adaptable. So what is more important, being creative or having strong research skills as a game designer? You need both. Like you, you can't say that one is more important than the other. Like to be a good designer, you do need to reinterpret, reimagine, and, and find new things within uh, your gameplay experiences. Okay. But you can't do that unless you are well uh, read and aware of what the body of working gaming is. You have to be able to research, deconstruct, and understand why things work right. for you to be able to deploy creativity. Um, the two sides of the same coin. You need to be able to do both. They're, they're equally important. Okay, last question. What do you see in Indian game designers compared to other game designers in other countries mm -hmm. in terms of skills and work ethic? Work ethic, second to none. People, people here really uh, care. They're passionate. They commit. They're more than willing to put in the hours. Um, I think almost to an excessive level. Like okay. there are times when I'm like, hey, go home, stop, it's done for the day. Um, learning when to give yourself a break and, and yeah. like step back and gain perspective is, is something that I think some of them could learn from. Um, in terms of skills, smart people. Um, okay. Building skills, there isn't, there isn't necessarily the, the industry here isn't necessarily developed enough that okay. there's, <clears throat> clear sets of skills and expectations yet for the majority of younger candidates coming in. Um, but they show a strong aptitude for picking up the skills and adapting to it, right. which is why I'm so optimistic about the game studios here is there's hard work, there's dedication, there's focus, and there's an adaptability to go, I don't know, I will go learn. Yeah. And I think that gives designers here a competitive advantage compared to the rest of the world at the moment. Um, I think the people who are coming up now in, in year one, two, by the time they hit year five and six, we're going to be looking at people and go, fantastic design talent in India. Great. All right, John, those are all the questions I have for you. Maybe the last question I could ask you would be for someone who is interested in contacting you or working for you at Play Simple, how can they get in touch with you? Sure. You can email me at uh, John Kelly at playsimple.in or find me on LinkedIn. Okay. I'm happy to always connect with people. Awesome. All Thank right. you very much. Thank, thanks a lot, John. Cheers.